Teemu Arina from the Biohackers podcast once again. This time I have an extremely interesting character to interview. It's Jesse Lawler from Smart Drug Smarts. Welcome. Hey, thank you. So what I find... normally I would be introduced as, as a as a person or a podcaster, but this time I got character, so I'm I'm moving up in the world. Yeah, I mean that's that's absolutely so. You are a jack of all trades. You're an engineer, a speaker, entrepreneur, podcaster. And what I find interesting about your background is is the way how you have basically throughout your career, you've been looking at different fields and been sort of not taking it for granted and just going really deep researching what's going on, going to the trenches, finding the best experts. And this is what you are now applying to the field of nootropics and cognitive enhancing compounds and finding the best researchers out there and turning them into comprehensible sources of information for people like me. Yeah, I, th- I think I've, uh, if I've got one thing in spades, it's probably been a lot of curiosity. And that's just kept me looking under rocks and, and kind of furthering off in strange directions that, you know, sometimes you run into blind alleys and things that don't aren't necessarily worth the time. But sometimes that comes in handy later and you can find interesting connections. Yeah. You have also been a biohacker for, uh, throughout your life, experimenting with diets and yeah. exercise and novel sleeping patterns and uh, also cognitive enhancers. I mean, can you tell me a little bit more about your sort of uh, career in uh, uh, improving the character that you're behind? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm like a second generation health nut. My dad uh, definitely sort of got the family started on this. And um, you know, I've, I've maybe taken it a little bit further to the uh, the lunatic fringe. But um, yeah, I guess the first thing that I did where I kind of veered off of the like, you know, standard American way of, of you know, health and health care was becoming a, a vegetarian and then a vegan for seven years, which at, at this point, I'm completely the opposite of that. I actually eat a lot of meat now. But that was the first time that I I really strayed from what maybe your average person does and, and kind of took my uh, my own health care by the horns a bit. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've experimented with some of the polyphasic sleeping methods for the last, um, you know, I guess for about the past 10 years it was when I became aware of nootropics as, as a field of chemicals that, that exist. And then for almost four years now, I've had the podcast Smart Drug Smarts where I've been calling up different researchers, neuroscientists, um, and the people that are that are making and testing some of these new compounds and chemicals, as well as things that have been around for, you know, 3,000 years and used in Chinese medicine or whatever. Um, but we're actually getting the data on them now and just trying to find out what works, what doesn't, what's overblown, and um, and also what's going to be particularly effective, you know, for me um, and, and for other people trying to figure out um, – how to how to best test things on a personal level because I feel like there is a, quite a bit of personal variation that we see in how different things, different interventions in general affect different people. There's so much variation within each of our individual diets and you know lifestyle habits and all this stuff that there don't seem to be any um you know real cognitive silver bullets, but there are a lot of you know silver pea shooters that can have um, you know specific effects for specific people. Right on. So why did you start experimenting with diets? Was was it like some health issue? Um, let's see. That, that's a good question. I, I think that I started experimenting with diet probably initially because like in my, you know, early 20s, let's say like 23, 24, I was still getting acne. I mean, not like terrible acne, like, you know, I can't go outside, but, you know, I kind of felt like, hey, this is supposed to end when you're not a teenager anymore, and I'm definitely not a teenager. And so I just sort of started tinkering. Um, For me, I think it was actually probably a milk allergy. I used to drink a ton of milk. One one thing, like I said, my dad was a health nut, and so I was lucky enough that I grew up in a house that did not have a lot of, you know, carbonated beverages and cola around. That really wasn't something that we drank, but, you know, in order to sort of fill that gap in in our beverage, Beverages. Um, we drank just a heck of a lot of milk and chocolate milk and stuff like that was always around. So I probably consumed maybe you know three times as much milk as the average young person did, and, and this you know lasted into my early twenties. Um, and, and I think probably had a lot to do with the fact that I, I did have some some acne that hung around for longer than it it should have. Um, but yeah, once I started sort of tweaking with my diet, that became a self propelling process. Once I realized I actually you know could have effects on my life and how I felt, um, so- I, I wanted to see what more there was. A quick question, uh, by the way, just pointing out that Finland is one of the largest consumers of milk products in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we have a big industry on that side, and we have more osteoporosis than anywhere else in the world. 
Uh, mm. So, so I mean, if you look into, for example, China or you just go to East, what you have is people are not really drinking milk. And what do they have? Yeah. They don't have at least osteoporosis. So the calcium theory that you don't get calcium if you don't drink milk doesn't seem to hold in, in that sense or, or the people from China are completely different than we are. Yeah, or something. It's, it's fascinating. The, um, the whole concept of you are what you eat. It's like that's such an easy thing to remember and it makes intuitive sense when you hear it. But more and more, we're finding out that's not true. If you are what you eat, then eating a bunch of fat foods would make you physically obese. We've, we've seen plenty of examples of that not, that not being the case. And your point about milk and osteoporosis is another great one. You really are not what you eat. I mean, there's a relationship, but it's not a, a straightforward relationship like that. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I also started experimenting with diets for, for things like acne. I mean, it's, it's just like a horrible thing to have or a nuisance and uh, what worked for me was a combination of diets and and also also just like um, starting to use things on my skin as well and just getting rid of a lot of the um, a lot of the cosmetics etc that have have some toxins in them and soaps and, right. and all that so there is a lot of like kind of this chemical load that comes from our environment that is causing havoc to our systems I forget who I was speaking with about this, but uh, it was a, I think a guy who worked for the National Institute of Health about all the chemicals in the environment. And he, you know, basically kind of shrugged at the end and said, you know, the experiment is in progress. It's like we have this massive multivariable experiment with all the, you know, the chemicals, some of which are toxic, some of which are probably totally inert that we're exposed to. And, and we'll, we'll just have to see, and, you know, unfortunately, unless you literally want to go out and live in the woods, um, you know, it, it's impossible to limit your exposure completely. And even if you live in the woods, I mean, there, there are, you know, natural lakes that have high levels of arsenic and stuff like that. So, you know, even, even in the, um, you know, the caveman times that I think some people probably unrealistically hearken back to, there was never a totally pristine human environment for us to live in. Luckily, I mean, our bodies are made to withstand a certain amount of stress too. That's for sure. That's for sure. And if you just look at it, uh, the cosmetics industry or anything that you put on your skin seems to be less regulated than anything you put inside of your body. But, That's a great point. But the philosophy that I have or just practical like uh, things that I do is that I would never put on my skin something that I wouldn't eat. So, so that's, that's one way to think about it. So, uh, um, you're, you're not big on sunscreen. Either that or you have tastier sunscreen there than I do here. Yeah. But then again, I mean, science is discovering such so many beautiful things about the human body and when we get to the topic of nootropics i mean this this cognitive enhancing compounds some of them are kind of natural coming from plant materials like mm -hmm. bacopa monieri and uh, and and cordyceps and all those things cool cool things and and then on the other hand we have a lot of synthetic compounds and and chemicals that uh, as far as i know many of them are not found from nature but are designer drugs in a way so what do you think about this distinction yeah um well it's interesting i i kind of feel like a lot of people put undue emphasis on the distinction of designer like you know man-made compounds versus things that have been around um you know pre-existing in nature and, and automatically kind of give a, an extra couple of, you know, check marks of approval to natural compounds. There, there's some sense in doing that in that if people have been using a compound for a long, long time historically, then it's probably pretty safe to assume that it's not going to, you know, make you have a baby born with three heads or, or do anything profoundly terrible or at least acutely profoundly terrible. Um, however, you know, th there are certainly things in the natural environment that have, have long-term uh deleterious effects for people. And there are also things that we found, um, you know, chemicals that have been man-made that have been used in, in some cases for 100 years plus that really seem to be fairly beneficial if used um, properly. You know, one, one interesting example of that actually is a compound called methylene blue, which um, I, I think this was like the first drug that was completely synthetic that was uh, used, you know, for treating, treating humans on anything. This was, a, it's like a, um, if you get poisoned with cyanide, for example, mm -hmm. methylene blue is to this day what they use to kind of, uh, re restart your circulatory system and heart and kind of get you, um, you know, operating again. But it's also been found to have, have cognitive benefits, 
for memory and overall cognition. Um, it, it helps to essentially speed up the mitochondria, which are the, the energy producing areas of the cell. But it, it operates like at a very tight um, dosage range. If you go up to a certain dosage threshold, it can have all these positive benefits. Then it becomes neutral for a very short time, and then it quickly becomes negative. Hmm. And, and I think that um, that sort of dosage response, that hormetic response, is something that uh, needs to be taken, taken very seriously. The, the nice thing about natural compounds is that, um, again, we, we, we know about them from years and sometimes centuries of experience. And if something were going to be overtly terrible for us, that would sort of be there in the, the cultural wisdom. Right. I think I, I heard from your podcast, I don't remember exactly who you interviewed, but it was about some of the natural compounds and, and the researchers said that uh, it, sometimes like these natural extracts seem to have a more stable kind of effect on the, on the human uh, human body compared to just extracting a specific compound that is bioavailable. So it seems to that there's some kind of synergy going on when when these things get absorbed that simultaneously through different pathways they they create a specific kind of let's say stable effect that our body is is used to recognize uh, from an evolutionary perspective. Do you think that makes any sense? Um, yeah, although I, th I think it will probably vary. A great deal from one plant to the next. I mean, th there are some plants called adaptogens, and I, I think adaptogen might be an umbrella term for living things, and that some uh, fungus are also considered adaptogens, which sort of normalize the the body's physical processes. If you're if you're overstimulated, it can bring you down. If you're understimulated, it can bring you up. Which is which is a really interesting uh, you know property for anything that you can consume to have. However, there I th I'm sure that there are also probably plenty of examples of things that aren't going to have an adaptogenic response, but instead are going to, you know, completely stimulate you or, you know, completely depress and kill you or um, whatever it is. So it's a matter of finding the correct plants. Uh, I spoke with, um, this was a, a researcher named uh, Dr. Neil Grunberg on, he's one of the world's leading experts on tobacco. And he was, um, you know, he studies the tobacco plant in, in all its forms, whether it's, um, you know, coming in through cigarette smoke or, you know, a nicotine patch or, or whatever. And one of the really fascinating things about tobacco is it's it's got a few hundred active ingredients within within the plant, but then when you burn it, each of those shatter into something you know like an average of ten or so. So you wind up with like seven thousand physiologically active compounds if you're smoking tobacco versus, for example, eating tobacco. And um, I, I think that's one of the things that makes the research into naturally occurring compounds both so difficult and also so potentially valuable is that you're not looking at just one specific chemical. You're looking at this giant bouquet of things which not only are acting on the body but potentially interacting with one another and sometimes just teasing apart which compounds are having um, the, the effects can be um, right. you know, really, really challenging. So, since some of them might be at odds with one another. Some of them really might, might be like arm wrestling one another to get your body to go one direction or another. Yeah, yeah. Basically competing on... Uh receptor sites and and so many other things and yeah there's some interesting um sort of evolutionary history that when, when you start getting into this you can you can imagine like you know literally um pollen and bees are a classic example of synergistic organisms that have have um evolved in concert with one another and so you know the, the bees are talking to the plants the plants are talking to the bees directly through chemical signals now i i think it's fair to say that with humans we don't have any plants with which we are directly co-evolved, certainly not to the extent of a bee. But on the other hand, you know, there are probably people that would make the opposite argument that you look at some of our food crops, things like, you know, rice or tobacco or, um, you know, I don't know, chia pets at this point, uh, things that probably exist in, in far greater supply today since humans have started, you know, domesticating and, and mass raising plants than they had previously. Um, certainly, we have affected our plant species evolution. The question, I guess, would be interesting to think about is, you know, to what extent have they affected ours specifically in the past 10,000 years since we've started, um, you know, really industrial agriculture? Hmm. So, I mean, uh, I, I'm using something like rhodiola uh, at mm -hmm. the moment, rhodiola rosea, which is, yeah. uh, I found it really good for uh, just winding down from a long day especially if I've been speaking in conferences, etc. I feel yeah. like I'm sort of like my receptors are a bit overloaded. And, and when I have a little bit of that, it's just like 
makes me go for a few more hours and and be more receptive. So, what are your favorites? Like, what what do you what do you play around with? Um, let's see. I guess as far as my favorites, I, I'm a, a fan of the nicotine patch. I, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life, but I, I have really been brought around by the um, the research and, and my personal you know feelings when I've taken nicotine. Um, I, I, at this point, like one patch is is too much for me, but I'll, I'll literally cut one in half with the scissors and put it on. Sometimes it's nice for a little bit of uh, you know extra cognitive oomph and focus. When I'm doing computer programming and I kind of I know exactly what I want to accomplish and just sit down for a long jag and kind of put the blinders on. I'm a fan of um, modafinil and armodafinil. They're basically the same thing. I generally take armodafinil, which is a, a chemical cousin. And then when I'm looking to do something sort of a more creative bent, if I'm uh, oftentimes if I'm like working on like editing a podcast or coming up with final notes on that or, or doing some writing, I will um, gravitate towards. Um, Aniracetam, or sometimes oxyracetam. Um, what else? Um, Rhodiola rosea. You mentioned. I mean, that that's great for a, a stress response. I don't find. I, I find it to be more of a, a physical feeling of kind of you know extra vim and vigor. I, I don't notice um, much of a mental response on that one, but. Yeah, um, I've, not, I've noticed when I go to the gym that I can do an extra set if I just like. Has yeah, rodeo in my system, so it seems to seems to ex- help there. So also, chaga, which is a yeah. medicinal mushroom, birch trees, uh, increases endurance, uh, and and there is some research that shows that it, it, it does that. So there's all this new information coming out on on many of these compounds. Um, you mentioned the the different racetams, and and that's yeah. a, that's I mean that's one of the like classical sort of compounds of nootropics. Um, it's the original nootropic, paracetam. It's where the, the, the word was coined, actually, to describe paracetam in a, a theoretical chemical family. Hmm. Uh, that's one thing. I, I guess that's not available in any natural like plant source or anything. So no, no, it was invented, and in, I think it was like 1965 when it was first uh, chemically synthesized. But yeah, that, that's a fully man-made compound. And uh, one interesting effect that I, I've heard that it has is, is something that's related to blood sugar uh, stabilizing effects and blood sugar control, mm-hmm. uh, which might be because it increases the energy uh, uh, consumption uh, in the brain. Basically, probably the brain just like cranks out more of that stuff. I don't know, but it's like um, what like subjective effects have you seen? Like, well, for per- paracetam, which is the original member of the racetam family. I have never felt it subjectively. Some people do and some people don't. Um, it's really interesting. I mean, the, the people that, you know, like I love paracetam, they will talk about having um, sharper colors in their visual field. Like literally the world looks a bit you know brighter and more um, heavily saturated to them. Um, talk about improvements in verbal fluency and working memory and like not having the word sort of trapped on the tip of your tongue but being able to you know grab it out of thin air and and say whatever you want to say very very easily um most of the studies on parastam and there have been a lot because it's been around for a long time and and been in active use particularly in europe for a long time show significant benefits especially for older people that are starting to go into cognitive decline somebody that might be coming up on um you know, dementia or early stage Alzheimer's. There have been studies also with younger people of, of like college age and, and thereabouts that show um, benefits also, not quite as extreme, but it's kind of like what you would expect. The the worse off condition that your starting point is, the easier it is to make improvements. If your brain, you know, has only had 20 years of wear and tear versus 70 years of wear and tear, there's not quite as much help mm-hmm. necessarily to be given by one of these compounds. So, um, but yeah, so Physiologically, the, there seems to be a lot of evidence that uh, the racetams are neuroprotective, and it, it's almost kind of like an insurance policy for your brain cells. So I've taken paracetam on occasion, but because it wasn't something that had an overt, uh, like a, a physiological effect that I could feel, something that uh, made a perceptual difference for me, I wound up gravitating to some of its chemical cousins. Um, like I said, aniracetam is kind of my personal favorite of the racetams that I've tried. And that's one that where I, I kind of can feel it, you know, oomph me up. And um, I, I feel like my, my working memory is improved and it kind of gives me more of a creative streak. So, I mean, if these, if these compounds don't have such a drastic, like, change in your perception and not necessarily, like, turn you into a 
into a mega brain beast like cranking out numbers and, and just like uh, winning the stock market every time just like yeah. in the limitless movie uh, but they have this kind of uh, uh, neuroprotective effects and uh, and maybe some like i mentioned some metabolic perhaps benefits uh, why are they controlled i mean why, why these things are not allowed to be used uh, uh, for let's say recreational purposes or just like for longevity purposes and why is it only for you know treating a medical condition well, I, I think it varies a lot from compound to compound and from country to country. Um, th- there are a lot of cognitive enhancing compounds that are, you know, fully legal everywhere, and that you can you can get by hook or by crook. I mean, one example, of course, is caffeine. Caffeine is is the most you know widely used psychotropic substance in the world. Ninety percent of adults worldwide have caffeine daily, mm-hmm. and it definitely has effects on your brain, as as you know, I think everybody's going to be familiar with. Um, there are other things like. I guess a good example of something that would be controlled almost everywhere, but but is also a cognitive enhancer, would be um, some of the ADHD drugs, things like Adderall and uh, methylphenidate, which is known as Ritalin. Um, and, and these are amphetamine-based compounds. So despite the fact that there, there's definitely some benefits to be had, um, they're potentially addictive, like you know, yeah. potentially highly addictive. I think you know, pretty much you, you will be addicted if you take them. Um, and side, and, side effects, etc. Yeah, yeah uh, people people uh, experience um, mood changes oftentimes, and, and people that I've spoken with about Adderall, it's been interesting hearing how there's sort of a learning process about how to monitor and modulate your own moods and your emotional reactions to other people because the way that you feel about things while you're on Adderall will not be the way that you feel about things afterwards. I spoke with um, – if I'll go on this aside just because I think it's interesting. But I spoke with one woman who has taken Adderall extensively for a period of time. But she says she's a fairly introverted person normally, is you know kind of more bookish and would just prefer to be doing things by herself. But she gets very, very socially gregarious and likes being around people and becomes sort of more of a life of the party type when she's on Adderall. But then what she, she would wind up like making social obligations and agreeing to go and hang out with people and stuff like that when she was on Adderall. And then when she went back to her normal self, she was like, I just kind of want to stay at home. And, and so she kind of realized she needed to like muzzle herself when she was going to be taking this compound so that she didn't um, you know, write checks that her, her antisocial self couldn't cash later. That sounds like a drastic transformation of the personality. I mean, almost, yeah. like a, almost kind of like a psychedelic trip and, and people – in the establishment, I mean, I, I would guess that they don't like like just like people changing and starting to think differently. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I consider myself very socially liberal, but I, I also see where society becomes a bit more confusing if if people's personalities become less consistent. It's like I'm, I'm open to a wide vari- variety of personalities, but it's kind of nice if the next time I meet a given person, they behave in a predictable pattern. It's like when people's um, you know, ability to predict how you know, Bob or Joe or Susie is going to behave uh, changes radically. That can be that can be yeah. hard to handle. Yeah, exactly. Which personality I'm dealing with today. Uh, yeah. Now, going back to the health uh, aspects, uh, because original definitions of nootropics are about the fact that uh, they they are they, they are supposedly safe. So. Uh, the original definitions start from yeah. the perspective that there is not a massive change in heart rate or or blood pressure and and, and many of these other things that would would point towards uh, highly stimulatory potentially uh, uh, life threatening even side effects. So so it's sort of supposedly safe, but it should be cognitive enhancing, etc. So. But, but is this the case for all nootropics? So is it sort of like an umbrella term that sort of captures a little bit too much? Just that, that, that's, a, that's a great question because, yeah, I'd like to highlight that. It's something I sort of try to beat this drum of that, like the dictionary definition of nootropics versus sort of the advertising moniker that's thrown around nowadays are two very, very different things. You'll hear, you know, like Ritalin, for example, described as a nootropic when it doesn't doesn't even come close to meeting the criteria because it is potentially you know damaging long term you know it is addictive there are these these viable downsides and and quite honestly um the the dif- dictionary definition of nootropics is so glowing so positive so nothing wrong with it at all that i think it would be a tough set of bars for any chemical to make it over um it, as i remember there's there's sort of five points it needs to be long term neuroprotective it needs to help with memory it needs to help with cognitive um, or rather executive function it needs to 
uh, not ha- be something that you can build up a tolerance to. So it needs to work the same tomorrow as it does today, even if you took it today. And um, I, I think maybe I already said non-addictive, but non-addictive was in there somewhere. So it, it's a pretty, um, you know, any chemical that can meet all of those requirements is is probably a chemical you want to be taking. I mean, it, it's a pretty um, you know, positive set of things to say. I like to use the terms um, smart drugs and cognitive enhancers sort of interchangeably and it sort of is a wider umbrella to include things like Adderall and Ritalin that that do have some downsides, but also have some cognitive upsides. Um, because I feel like that uh, it, that way, that way, I can sort of hold the term nootropics to a slightly higher, um, a more privileged status. Right. One uh, thing that you mentioned earlier was modafinil, and there was some news yeah. that got around recently. That's sort of like the first supposedly safe way to improve cognition. Uh, well, I've, I've looked at the research and what I understood about it is that it is metabolized by the liver. So it has potentially some effects on the liver and maybe even side mm-hmm. effects with other drugs. It is also something that increased the heart rate and blood pressure in people. And when I think of the heart as a muscle, and if you think of it as a muscle that could have a specific number of beats throughout your life. So, so what are you doing? I, I hope not. I, that's, it's terrible to think of your heartbeat as like a counter going down. That would be scary. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you're just like, uh, the way how I think it is sort of like you are speeding up time. So you are cramming more into a specific moment of time. So you're, I mean, able to think more faster, get things done, etc. But do you pay the consequences of, uh, you know, pushing a little bit too much the boundaries of your... Uh, biology? Well, I I think that we have, um, most Western culture kind of has this attitude of you can't get something for nothing. And if you see a benefit somewhere, there's got to be a cost. There's no such thing as a free lunch, that sort of idea. Um, Almost kind of like an original sin sort of mentality, which I I don't think is necessarily backed up by the science. I think that there there are some things that there's almost nothing bad to say about it. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing bad to say about, you know, probably walking an extra, you know, 5,000 or 10,000 steps a day. It's like walking seems to be very good for your body, very good for your heart, very good for, uh, your, um, you know, creativity and things like that. So, so not, not everything does have a downside. Now, as, as far as modafinil, I mean, there certainly are downsides. One interesting thing that you didn't mention is it, it's, it's also something that messes with, um, birth control, with hormonal birth control in women, if they're taking birth control and taking modafinil, they could very uh, likely become pregnant because it kind of throws that whole system off. I don't remember exactly why that is, but it's something that a lot of people probably aren't aware of. And, uh, you know, I could come back to bite them if uh, so, they sounds, don't know about that. Sounds like grapefruit juice. I mean, grapefruit juice is, is a classic example in medical school that it in- interferes with the metabolism of the birth control pills in the Interesting. in the liver, which is, if I remember correctly, by the cytochrome P450 system in the liver. So, mm-hmm. so, so many drugs actually have like pretty serious side effects if they, if they mess up with that system. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, there are things to be aware of. And, you know, uh, both modafinil and armodafinil are, um, you know, prescription drugs in the U.S. and I think in most parts of Europe as well. They're they're relatively easy to get around, ha- get without having a prescription. There are places that sell them online, sort of in a gray market. But I, I would recommend if anybody's really interested in either of those to, you know, talk with their doctor, sort of go the legal route. So that way, if they are on any other medications or just have any other, you know, health health issues in their life, they kind of have this looked at a bit more carefully. Um, and, and, you know, and by the way, just for any listeners, don't order any of this stuff online without first consulting your doctor. So that's a disclaimer, uh, which brings yeah. to my next question is, I mean, which one of the sort of like supposedly safe ways to support your cognitive function exists out there that are not like prescription drugs that you need to get? Oh, well, I I mean, as far as that goes, I mean, I I would be remiss if I did not mention that I actually mixed up a um, a, a couple of different stacks. We've got one which is a mitochondrial enhancer and includes um, an interesting compound called solbuthiamine is sort of at the heart of that one. And then we've got another one called Nexus, which, as I mentioned, aniracetam is my favorite of the racetams. We built a couple of sort of supporting chemicals around that one. Um, and, you know, both of those are, you know, available to be purchased within Europe and the U.S. and things like that. There, there are a lot of over-the-counter supplements that um, 
people can get good effects on. And again, get caffeine is another classic example. Tobacco is another classic example, or not, not tobacco rather, but uh, nicotine is another classic example where these things are, are readily available to adults in most parts of the world without going through a doctor or a pharmacist. Um, and, and I guess something else that we should mention is that the dose really does matter. Um, that, that should be obvious, but it's not always. I mean, we talked about, you know, Adderall is a stronger drug than caffeine. But if you have, you know, 10 cups of coffee at once, that's going to be an effect that's a lot more than, than a single cup of coffee. And if you have a, a very small dose of Adderall, you might not even notice. So um, what comes to my mind also is choline supplements, which are right. rampant, like citicoline and alpha GPC and so on. And if you I've noticed that if you if you take those things, which you also get naturally, by the way, the calling compounds from egg, yeah. egg, 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 egg yellows, etc., is that you can have some like headaches and, and other things uh, coming out of it. It's interesting. And people also get choline depletion headaches. Um, the, the choline group is an interesting one. So basically any choline source... I'm going to skip over some of the biochemistry here because it's A, confusing, and I don't really understand it, uh, but B, it doesn't really matter in this case. Um, choline winds up as, as something called acetylcholine within the brain most often, um, which is one of the primary neurotransmitters and tends to be, it's not in all cases, but it's normally an excitatory or sort of a stimulatory neurotransmitter. It, it makes you... Um, you know, basically makes certain neurons more likely to fire, which makes things more likely to happen. It doesn't calm you down. It amps you up. Um, now, when, when you're taking one of the racetam compounds, which we mentioned earlier, that tends to make the brain go through acetylcholine faster. And so sometimes people will stack what they say, you know, combine, take these complementary compounds of aracetam along with a choline supplementing compound at the same time. So as your brain is burning through acetylcholine faster, it'll also be kind of, you know, shoveling more acetylcholine precursors into the fire to make sure that you don't have this, um, you know, choline crash. That, that's exactly what I meant when I, when I earlier said that you're speeding up time in a way. I mean, you're just like burning resources, uh, throwing a little bit more wood into the fire to get get more yeah. things done, and and I, I just want to say this um, that what I'm worried about is that in cultures where people are geared towards this kind of performance culture and getting shit done kind of culture, which I see a lot in the U.S., not so much in the Europe. I mean, I was just in Italy and France in the in the Mediterranean. They have a pretty slow life over there. You know, it's yeah. kind of and Sp- Spanish people in you know, a manana it's like they're not they're, they're not necessary in any kind of hurry to do anything now if you go to some other cultures maybe you know Japanese uh, Chinese uh, American people sometimes are a bit more geared towards like this kind of like you know being high yeah, sort of ticker and, tape mentality yeah yeah and I, I, what I I'm not worried about you know that I'm, I'm worried about the recovery and if you if you see nootropics as a way out, as a, as a way of somehow fixing the problems that you have, you're already working a lot and you don't feel energy, then you buy these compounds to feel that you're performing better. Um, I, I, I guess like that's like burning the candle from both ends and not using these tools in an intelligent manner. Yeah, I, I, what that makes me think about is sometimes people don't, and I, I plead guilty to this also, um, but it, it's easy to forget that our bodies need to run on cycles. You know, women have monthly cycles, and everybody has a daily cycle. Um, every every creature on Earth, you know, has, has cyclicality based on you know yeah. light and dark. It makes and, sense to sleep, even though you can modafinil not to sleep, right? Yeah, exactly. So trying to artificially extend our periods of you know wakefulness or our period of sleep, or really really kind of you know getting off of a twenty four hour cycle, you're you're swimming upstream against your own biochemistry. Now, I, I think trying to intelligently optimize your performance during you know, your, your waking period or your sleeping period or things like that, that's great. Um, and, and I think there's, there's a lot of things to be said in favor of doing that, but don't get in a situation where you start arm wrestling against your 24 hour cycles. I mean, that's, it's, it's not a battle you're going to win. It's, it's a battle where it's not a war you're going to win. You can win the battle for a couple of days. I mean, you could, you could, you know, take a number of things that'll keep you up for 72 hours or longer than that, but uh, eventually you're going to lose that war. And it's, it's probably just not a war that's, that's worth engaging in. I think it was Tim Ferriss who said that uh, about nootropics that 
there is always some downsides and i mean you, you get the benefits but then you need something like more rest more sleep more recovery time so so there's a price to be paid by uh, using some of these things sometimes I, th- I think if it's if it's a new tropic like by the dictionary definition there really shouldn't be a downside exactly. but you know it, what, what's interesting is like if you think about something like you know mdma or ecstasy the street drug which you know makes people famously you know feel great you know in love with everybody in the world's a you know happy rainbow sunbeam place um and, and a lot of that has to do with a massive upregulation of the serotonin in the brain it's like if your brain is a, a sponge with some serotonin in it the mdma kind of squeezes all the serotonin out and you feel great for however long that that trip lasts but then so you kind of like go way above your baseline as far as mood but then you kind of have this crash where you all of a sudden you know the day after or whatever you know your brain has been squeezed there's nothing left in the sponge and so the normal amount that would kind of you know leak out into your brain for daily use you kind of need to build up your reserves and so you kind of have this you know oscillating like you can think of it as like a, a diminishing sine curve uh, where you go way below baseline before eventually kind of restabilizing now i i think kind of what would define a, a nootropic is the response where whether it's cognition or mood or whatever it is that you're you're seeking to amplify, you come above your baseline, but instead of like going way under your baseline on this bounce back period, you just kind of smoothly get back down to baseline. If you can find the compounds or or the, you know, this doesn't just go for drugs, but you know any any strategy that is going to improve you above your baseline and kind of bring you in for a smooth landing rather than you know the, the crash and rebound I, th- I think that's what we should all be looking for i think that's what i uh, remember seeing in some of the graphs that are depicted about um, the effects of uh, adaptogenic plants the, the kind of plants that help you to adapt to stress they have this kind of yeah. effect compared to caffeine instead of having like a huge stimulatory effect and then a crash you get like a kind of like constant nice long-term uh, stabilizing stimulation so not going too much or uh, not being too less in in that regard so um i, I want to ask you a little bit more about i mean you, you are definitely like scanning everything that's out there so which ones are the ones that you find have the like best um uh, you know, grounding in terms of studies that show the efficacy and, and which are supposedly safe and used long term and, and have as the highest likelihood of actually having any effect. And, and then um, we can follow up that with the question of like, what are the novel ones that are sort of interesting on the fringe coming up and we don't really know what they're doing right now. Right. Um- there's definitely a strong correlation between how old something is and how many studies have been done on it. I mean, that's not a you know one-to-one correspondence, but if something's been around for 50 years versus five years, it's probably been studied more. So um, I feel like for, for the really old things, actually, I'll probably see ginseng maybe uh, – would be a really worth recommending as far as it's known and, and proven cognitive effects. It, in some studies for for cognitive enhancement, it has been found to actually be have a greater magnitude of effects than modafinil or armodafinil, which it surprises a lot of people and surprised me when I heard it um, that a you know natural plant based you know thing that's been around for thousands of years has has stronger effects than a um, you know, a, a lab chemical that's been recently invented and is pretty well heralded for its ability to, um, you know, make people focus. And is, so, this, yeah. and this, is this about the red ginseng or the Siberian ginseng or the American ginseng? Yeah, so which yeah, one? yeah. I, I think this was American ginseng that that particular study was found on. Um, I'm not familiar with red. I, I, the two major varieties that I know about are, are the Asian and the American, uh, both of which have benefits, I think. I think that the Asian was a little bit more beneficial for long-term memory, um, but I, I could be wrong about that. We, we did an episode on that, which would actually be really worth, um, you know, if people want to check out one episode of my show, the ginseng one wouldn't be a bad one. That would be a, um, yeah, that, one I would, that I would definitely excellent. highlight. That was excellent. I will put that into the show notes. Uh, I mean, there is, there is a lot of things that are sort of referred as ginseng, like, I mean, the Indian ginseng is ashwagandha. Right. Or Eluetero, the Siberian ginseng. And some even call Rhodiola rosea the, the ginseng of the north or, or Lapland, etc. It gets I, confusing. It's yeah, confusing. Yeah, sort of it's, I mean, it's kind of, they're probably comparing it to its sort of uh, um, kind of uh, the, the reputation of ginseng uh, from, from, yeah. from the Chinese medicine. So, but yeah, I guess just to, to go over some of the ones that are, are pretty well studied and found to be effective. Um, for the natural compounds, I I like ginseng. I like um, 
Bacopa monera you mentioned that's been found to have strong pro memory effects. Uh, Rhodiola rosea is is a good general uh, physical health sort of anti stressor anti stress response uh, compound. Uh, won't necessarily have as much in the way of cognitive effects. And and I think that the racetam family in um, in the case of synthetics has been pretty darn well studied. Now, they keep making new racetams all the time. There's a lot of compounds that people will find with, with the suffix racetam. So there's, uh, you know, piracetam, aniracetam, oxyracetam, pramiracetam. It, it's like 15 or 20 of them now. Um, and, and the newer ones probably realistically haven't been studied nearly as much as the older ones. So I, I would tend to probably stick with the original three, um, or, uh, which would be uh, paracetam, Aniracetam, oxyracetam, I think was the order that the, the first three were invented in. Um, Pramiracetam is one that I think is quite a bit newer, but also seems to be pretty well studied. It's active at much lower doses. So um, you, you want to check the, the you know hmm. recommended doses of these things very carefully. And then there, there's also a chemical cousin called Nupept, which was invented in Russia, sort of inspired by the, the biochemistry of the racetam compounds. It, it, some people consider it a racetam, others don't. It doesn't have the same uh, word suffix, but um, that's also been pretty well studied. It's been around for you know 20 years plus, and I, I think is a safe synthetic to recommend to people, again, at the proper doses, and, you know, check up on all these things individually. I remember it's available over the counter in Russia, so... So, yeah. And so on, but in some some countries, it's uh, uh, some of these things might be actually like scheduled, like or pharmaceutical compounds. If you take like piracetam, for example, in Finland, it's uh, mainly officially can be used for treating uh, uh, some some muscle spasms and also some ADHD things. Uh, so, oh, so yeah, and modafinil is only for narcolepsy, so it's not even for shift workers or uh, flight captains, etc. Interesting. That it's available huh. in uh, the U.S. So there is differences, differences between countries. Uh, some some countries don't even. It's completely unknown from a legislation perspective uh, to them. Uh, by the way, we are working on the. Uh, we already published that in Finnish, uh, the Biohackers Handbook chapter on the mind, and we are translating that now into English. And uh, it lists fantastic. It, it has a huge list of some of these studied uh, nootropic compounds that are. Uh, not scheduled, so so the ones that um, have have uh, have some history and have been used and are are so far not considered as uh, uh, as drugs that should be controlled. So so there's still some things out there that that you can play with. Uh, but but then again, it seems that uh, when it comes to these kind of compounds that have some kind of pharmacological effect, uh, it's uh, in some some cases, they get scheduled for no reason. Like, um, uh, I mean, I mean, just um, just because they they have not a long, they are novel compounds. They have been recently invented, uh, and that's by the way, in legis- from legislation perspective, in Finland, uh, if something doesn't have like tens, hundreds of years of historical use. It it cannot be sold as a, as a, as a supplement uh, mm-hmm. in, in that sense. So it can be banned as a kind of food ingredient, also, uh, which which almost happened to chaga, but they they were uh, good enough to, to then uh, overthrow that judgment because I mean it's been used here for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Wow. Yeah. I mean the, the medical establishment, I think, in in all countries is inherently conservative. I mean that that's the sort of Type of people that I think go into you know uh, re- reviewing chemicals for for bureaucratic organizations, and it, it's it's a good thing that they are. I think, um, and maybe, especially, and maybe sometimes also they do this to uh, try to like limit competition from pharmaceutical drugs. Do you think that's the case also? Well, I, th- I think there's probably a variety of um, you know motives both completely above board and pristine, and also probably some some venal corrupt motives, and, and you know. Those things get mixed together. The thing is, um, when, when we're talking about cognitive enhancement for, you know, kind of young, vigorous people and blah blah blah. I mean, it's it's great, of course, if we can make our brains work better. I think there's there's huge arguments that can be made that society is pushed forward by the kind of people that are doing that. But um, it's important to remember also that we are talking about medical things and that medical treatments for people that, that have big problems in their life 
people people will grasp for straws and will if you know if you you think you're going to die or you think you've got a serious problem um you you will look for anything that's going to throw you you know a lifesaver of hope and um i think that the medical review boards are very conscious of that and not wanting to allow you know bad science or snake oil salesmen or any of these people into the the you know publicly accepted ring and say this is going to help you if it really hasn't been well, well established that it is helpful and and not too dangerous. So, I mean, they are doing a, a job as public watchdogs. And as much as you know, some of us sort of on on the fringe would like to see, um, you know, looser controls. I can also I can understand the argument from the opposite perspective. Hmm. So, so go, going back to my question now, for some of the compounds that you you discovered that are now being researched that are. Uh, have show uh, great great benefits perhaps cognitive enhancement properties and which are like not very well studied we don't really know when how they work and and so on so is there mm-hmm. anything interesting out there um yeah there, there's you know new stuff is getting invented all the time there's one uh two actually that, that have been around for a while in russia one is called cmax and the other is called Clank. um i'm trying to actually get an expert on those but it's just been difficult to find an english-speaking expert and uh my russian is not so hot so um it's some kind of peptide or what is it like y- yeah um it's found to have both cognitive and mood enhancing um effects it, it, i think this C-Link is sort of a, a chemical successor to C-Max. They you know, found some things that work slightly better. I'm not sure if C-Max has been sort of pulled off the shelves as a result. But yeah, that, that's one that I'm, I'm curious about finding out more about. Um, there's one called uh, BPC-157, which uh, I think they need a catchier name than that. But um, that, that's one that I've been hearing chatter about, and I'm trying to dig up a, a relevant um, subject expert for an interview. So, I mean, new, new things are coming up all the time, but I, I wouldn't want to just, you know, name drop some chemical names and have people say, oh, Jesse mentioned this is the new thing. And have people, you know, go and start mainlining these weird chemicals. I mean, the whole reason that, like, we're talking about them is because they haven't been you know, adequately tested enough where even, you know, those of us on the fringe know very much about them yet. So, I, I, my, my, yeah, I, I remember just an anecdote on this. I remember a paper written by one of the, like, inventors of uh, Sunifiram and Unifiram. Uh, yeah, families that I mean, there was a recent uh, article that that he published that um, he was contacted by someone who completely destroyed his brain by using these compounds, which are not very well studied. Uh, so, and, and that is also documented openly in the long, longer city forums where people are testing all these novel compounds and reporting their effects. So, uh, you don't necessarily want to be a human guinea pig for these things if you really care about yeah. your brain. So. Uh, if it if it comes with a weird name, you might want to check it out. Yeah, I mean th- th- that's what we have lab rats for. I mean, quite honestly, and, and if, you know, some people will say, well, you know, lab rat isn't a terribly good analog for a human brain. But I mean, the the point is, we only have one brain. And I, as excited as I am about the brain enhancement technologies that we have, th- the fact is that like medical technology is improving so fast by leaps and bounds. I, I fully expect that, you know, if five, 10 years from now, I get my arms and legs cut off in a wheat thresher accident. I'm going to be able to get some pretty good robotic arms and legs. Like I'm, I'm not so worried about that. The, the one part of my body that I really am worried about just maintaining is my brain. And I figure if I, if I maintain my brain in a pretty pristine condition, then the rest of my body is, is kind of expendable. And, and I feel like the problems with all the rest of the body will get solved well in advance of the brain. So um, I, I play pretty conservatively when it comes to uh, anything neurological. That's a very good point. I mean, you can have a artificial pancreas, liver, probably 3D printed soon. You can have probably better legs and hands than the original ones. I mean, more power. I think yeah. para- Paralympics is going to be something that's going to supersede like normal Olympics because they, those people are just going to perform better than anyone else. I completely agree. Completely yeah. agree. So, so I mean, thinking of doping, uh, like and that's a big thing and a big taboo now in the Olympics also that's going on and with what Russia's been up to. Now, how about work companies? Like you work as a, a programmer and, and you've done that kind of work. And I mean, people in Silicon Valley seem to be extremely excited about this technology, meaning cognitive enhancing uh, drugs, yeah. and diets. And now there was an article about some people who go for a break fast. So basically they are fasting and then they break the fast at some part of the week and they have breakfast together. And, and there's all these trends going on around and, and people are trying to find the edge. And I've even met founders who say that 
yeah, we are openly just like drugging our employees to get them to do more stuff. And, and now we are not talking about like illegal drugs, but nootropics. So uh, what do you think about this? Like, is, is it okay? I mean, would it be okay from a competitive per- perspective in a market to, you know, have this every company then suddenly needing if you are trading fi- in the financial markets that you need either artificial intelligence or like just enhanced humans running it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I as, as big a fan as I am of cognitive enhancement, it's not going to make up for, you know, bad or dumb employees. You can't take, you know, somebody that doesn't know their stuff, give them a pill and they're going to know their stuff. I mean, some stuff really does have to do with learning and practice and repetition. I feel like, um, you know, you can, you can certainly enhance let's take creativity as an example you can you can give somebody a pill that will probably make them more creative but creativity works on like conjoining different ideas that you already have if you don't have any ideas in the relative domain space to to find connections it, it, like your creativity is going to be based on my little ponies or you know whatever it is that you're into it's not going to necessarily be work applicable so you need to have some some domain expertise before any of these compounds are going to allow you to to amplify what you have i i really feel like it's important to recognize that um you know all, all these techniques and compounds are essentially amplifiers but you do need a baseline there to begin with now as as far as you know is it fair um, yeah, that seems like the last thing that, that most corporations ask is it, is it fair for me to outcompete my um, you know corporate rivals? I, I, I think the answer is definitively yes. I don't I don't think that's a question many CEOs are are asking themselves. The, the question is, you know, are they asking their employees to do anything that might be physiologically dangerous to their employees? Is it like you know the the um, the modern equivalent of like a coal mine where the you know the mm-hmm. coal mine could collapse on the miners and we're not taking good care of employees? You know th- that that's a viable question. If somebody um, you know said, hey, you know this drug was just invented in a, in a lab in China, we're not sure if it works, but uh, why don't you try it? I mean, as an employee, I would I would I'd probably not try that. I doubt it would be covered by my health insurance. Um, but on the other hand, it, you know, we've been distributing coffee to employees and businesses for who knows how long. And, and, and so I think there's a well-established history of that. And by law, I mean, coffee break. It's by law in many countries. Right. <laughs> so you, t- you just have to have a coffee break and otherwise you can't perform. So, and, and of, of course, also to add to that anecdote is that many countries, military, uh, is basically using these compounds to to run the operations. So modafinil, etc., have been used, and amphetamines, of course, like classically. Also here in Finland, in the great great wars, uh, Second World War, etc. These, I mean, people on the battlefield are just drugged all the time. But I, I don't, oh, yeah. I don't want to go into that rapid hole. But I want to uh, because I'm also running out of disk space to save this thing, <laughs> which is a good timekeeping thing. Um, so what are the like top experts that you go to? I mean, you interviewed many. And so what are the sources that you follow or the books uh, that you would recommend for anyone who's interested in this? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we find our experts generally based on looking at recent neuroscience papers. And if something is like, ooh, that paper was really interesting, that, that thing that they just discovered, then we just kind of go down the list of, of who the authors are and see if we can get in touch with them. Oftentimes, there'll be people that work at various academic institutions, and we can kind of chase them down that way. Um, yeah, as far as books, I mean, God, there, there's a great number of really interesting neuroscience books that I could recommend. Um I just read a – for people that are into brain health – I mean I guess it depends if you're talking about general brain stuff or um, actual cognitive enhancement. Last year, my favorite book was a book called um, Consciousness and the Social Brain by Dr. Uh, Michael Graziano. I had him on as a guest on, on one of the episodes. So if you want a kind of a preview of that book, you can um, listen to that episode. But, but I thought that was a fantastic one. There's a really interesting book called The Brain That Changes Itself. And that's about um, neuroplasticity, about different ways that people can, you know, bounce back from like a car accident where you get like a major concussive injury or something like that. Um, so some really eye-opening things about just how malleable our brains are. Um, what else would be a good one? Um, I read a really interesting book on um, sort of combining history and mental illness, but it had a lot of brain-relevant stuff in it. And that was called A First-Rate Madness. It came out three or four years ago. Um, and, and I've actually got a list of, on, on my website, I've got smartdrugsmarts.com slash bookshelf. And a lot of our past guests who are authors and just other books that we've referenced and found interesting, we have linked to from that page. So if people really want to uh, deep dive into neuroscience literature, um, there's a lot of recommendations up there. 
Cool. Uh, what online resources would you add? What is like your top three? Um, let's see. Well, I, I, I need to mention smartdrugsmarts.com. Um, but I, I, would, I, would I also, also, I would also yeah. put that on the list. Um, I, I love, um, I, although I'm not sure how to pronounce it, is either Aeon or Eon Magazine. Uh, it's spelled A E O N. They have a lot of great um, sort of you know science that's been pre digested by by good science authors. Um, uh, Ray Kurzweil has a newsletter. I, I forget exactly what it's called, but um, if you dig up Ray Kurzweil's newsletter, they send out a really interesting um, sort of smorgasbord of maybe the last weeks. Uh, neuroscience and, and sort of singularity type stories. Um, what else raw science wise? Um, oh, shucks. Um, H plus uh, humanity plus yeah. has um, interesting papers that they put out. Even, um, yeah, even, those even, are even in the nineties, they were like cranking out Mondo 2000. That was a magazine that covered everything from uh, gene manipulation to new tropics and so on. So this has been kind of a trend that's been going on for a while. Yeah. In, in some yeah. communities, um, you're going to be talking at the biohacker summit. That's going to be yeah. 18th of November that I'm putting together. So if anyone listening, check it out. Biohackersummit.com. It's going to be amazing. We're going to be covering new tropics and different ways to enhance your cognitive and physical performance. And, uh, it's, it's definitely something that i look forward to like i'm i'm gonna be just like dragging if possible uh cold, yeah. cold thermogenesis in there so people can immerse themselves in cold then they can maybe go into an infrared sauna maybe take a little bit of transcranial electrostimulation pop a few fish oils or whatever upgrade coffee and then have a cognitive test done uh, or some kind of sudoku memory game etc so that's going to be fun um so everyone is most likely, <laughs> it's just like uh, if you're a biohacker, anyone interested in this stuff, that's that's a. It's not a conference; it's an experience. You want to be there, and Jesse Lawler is also there. So um, super excited about that. Yeah. Um, uh, now, if uh, if people want to learn more about what you're up to, etc., so you mentioned smartdrugssmarts.com. Uh, is there anything else that they should look out for? I, I think if they wind up at the website or sign up for our newsletter, then it, th that's going to seed them with all the other information. I mean, we have a podcast that comes out weekly every Friday. I uh, have a newsletter that comes out weekly-ish. But um, yeah, if, if they wind up at the website, that gives them the opportunity to you know, get involved with any of our other stuff. We have a couple of supplements over at axonlabs.io, which are kind of my uh, you know my personal medicine cabinet. And um, yeah, I think those are the main things to know about. Yeah, and I think you work with... Uh, uh, Abelard Lindsay, who is one of the yeah, yeah. inventors of uh, some of the natural stacks uh, over at naturalstacks.com. So, so um, I mean, Jesse is working with uh, some some of the like best best people in in this nootropic industry to to bring these things out to you. So, um, I want to ask you one more thing. Like, yeah. if you would give to our listeners a tip of what can they do to enhance their cognitive capabilities without using any supplements or food items. So what, what should you do? Uh, take a nap every time you feel like taking a nap. Just take five minute, 10 minute, 20 minute cat naps throughout the day. Um, it, it's a great way to spring your brain back. Cool. Even if you don't actually fall asleep is the thing. Just like quiet space, letting your mind wander for 10 minutes can, can have almost the same benefits as if you actually do fall asleep. I totally agree. I had a nap today and I try to have a nap every day and... It really does make a difference also to my motivation to just do like the things that I should do every day. So it's, it's yeah. good to take that instead of playing Pokemon Go or, or just like browsing mindlessly on Facebook, just take a 30 minute nap. Yeah. Th things like meditation can be a bit harder and take some willpower, but you don't need any willpower to take a nap. You just need a piece of floor. That's for sure. All right. Cool. Thank you, Jesse. And uh, see you in Helsinki, Finland. Thank you, man. Looking forward to it. Cool.